Wow. And I'll start. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone to Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario's Indigenous Series. This is the first in a number of sessions that we will be hosting around Indigenous learnings and First Nation issues. Today, we are pleased to present our webinar entitled, Opening the Door to Indigenous Senior Community Outreach. Now, I'd like to uh, take care of some housekeeping items before we get started. Sure, I would. Hang on. Just let me share the deck again. All right. So, all attendees will be muted during the webinar. Um, this webinar is being recorded and will be placed on our website about 72 hours after the session is complete, giving us time to properly upload it. Uh, we're happy to have with us a sign language interpreter today who will be interpreting the session. Uh, you can adjust the size of the interpreter by dragging the line next to the interpreter to make the picture larger. Uh, the speakers will be visible throughout the presentation. If you do have any questions uh, for any of the panelists, please feel free to write your question in the chat box located in the bottom right um, of your screen. And my colleague Sheila uh, Schulein will keep track. Uh, she'll organize them and we'll have a time at the end of the session to answer these questions. Also, if you have any technical issues, please put those in the chat box as well, and we can address those immediately. There will be a short evaluation after the session that we will be asking you to complete. It will come up as a pop-up, and it's pretty short, less than 10 questions, but we would really appreciate if uh, uh, you could fill it out. We appreciate your feedback about the session, as well as any ideas or other topics for future webinars. Before we move forward with the presentation. Randy, uh, we, yes? we do have one um, that is, they can't see the translator. Oh, okay. Then. Thanks, Randy. Is that better? I hope. I have a, I have to apologize. I have a, a business degree with a major in computer science from 1988, which means I have to get my six-year-old granddaughter to help me with my cell phone. So technically I'm a little deficient. So bear with us today. Um, before we move forward with the presentation, I do need to let everyone know that there was a last minute change to our list of presenters. Sadly, the Urban Indigenous Sacred Circle was not able to participate in today's webinar. However, we were very lucky to have a wonderful speaker, Muriel Bittern, a family counselor, counselor specializing in PTSD and complex traumas, step in to speak. Muriel will be able to give us a very unique look at life and services through the eyes of remote Northern First, on First Nations Ontario. Randy, more yep. technical glitches. Um, yes. A little bit of technical support in the background here. And um, the suggestion is if those who are not speaking turn off their videos, the translator and the person speaking are likely the only ones who will show up. So we want, might want to try that simply because um, um, no one can see the uh, uh, interpreter yet. Sure, so if everyone can just go to uh, where it says stop video and just press stop video then until, uh, until you're on board to speak. Okay. Um, now I'd like to begin by reading our land acknowledgement. EAPO endeavors to honor this land and its treaties by strengthening our relationship and responsibilities to them. We live and work on Métis, Anishinaabek, Ojibwe, and Cree territories. The presence of settlers is not neutral. It has had and continues to have devastating impacts on many aspects of life for Indigenous peoples. Many of our practices, including the way we care for our elders, the ways we educate, and our methods of creating community, came to these lands through the ongoing process of colonialism. We hold a new understanding in our interactions and engagements with this land and its people. There is important work being done by many nations and allies to ensure the continued thriving communities and knowledge systems. Those of us who are settlers need to recognize that our knowledge 
and way of doing things may not be the priority as we work towards a safe Ontario for all seniors. All right, now, um, let's see. Uh, Now I'd like to introduce, I have the absolute honor to introduce our first speaker, or should I say singer, Marion Newman. Um, Marion is a First Nations English, Irish and Scottish mezzo-soprano. The Opera News was quoted saying that she sings with rich, opulent tone and her delivery pulses with the multiple meanings of her duplicitous existence. Ms. Newman's prominent career includes performances on international stages and on television, having featured five times as a soloist on CBC's National Aboriginal Achievement Awards. In the title role of Shana Dietit by librettist Yvette Nolan and composer Dean Burry, she received a Dora Award nomination. As Dr. Wilson in Marie Clements and Brian Current's opera Missing, Ms. Newman earned wide acclaim. She holds a Bachelor of Music in Piano Performance from the University of Victoria and a Master of Music with Distinction in Vocal Performance from the San Francisco Conservatory of Music. Elder Abuse Prevention Ontario is privileged to welcome Ms. Newman and greatly appreciates her participation in sharing her wonderfully rich voice to deliver a welcome song to open this webinar series. Now I just have to get your picture up on the screen. Thank you very much. There that was a very, very nice introduction. <laughs> um, I am honored to be here to open this meeting in a good way. Um, elders, uh, elders mean everything. And it is so important that we treat our elders with respect because they have the wisdom and the experience to share with us, to help us understand how to move forward and how to move forward in the best way we can. So I'm very honored. Thank you so much. Um, I, I would like to do a short introduction in Kwakwala, which is the language that, um, that I would have spoken had we not been forbidden from speaking our languages for so long. Um, and I have learned to introduce myself, so I'd like to do that now. Gela kasla, nukwam nikyeka, iachen lachet saksis. I am just saying hello, uh, welcome. Um, my name is Nikeka in, that's my ceremonial name, which means mountain. And the interpretation of that that I've learned from my elders is that as I go through life, I collect knowledge and experience with which I make a mountain and I see the world as if I am a mountain. So every direction and, um, and from the top of the mountain to the bottom of the mountain, I'm observing the world around me and learning always. Um, and I come from the northern tip of Vancouver Island, which traditionally we called Saxis, but it's, um, it's now called um, Fort Rupert. And I am Kwagyulth and Stalo. And I, um, I have uh, obtained permission to sing uh, a welcome song, which is to welcome everyone into the big house when we, when we are about to start ceremony. So this is to welcome you in. Oh, and I have my drum, which was painted by my dad. Uh, it's got the sun on it, which is one of our family crests, and then a whole bunch of other crests of animals around it that uh, it's really nice for me to have. I live in Toronto now, so it's nice to have this, this piece of home here with me. Okay, here's the welcome song. <clears throat> we ho Oh, hey, ah, oh, hey, ah. 
Wow. Thanks so much, Marion. Um, that was absolutely amazing. Uh, thank you so much for that gift of music. Uh, yeah, I think we need to take a moment to let that sink in. Huh. So, um, yeah, that was amazing. Um, next, I would like to give a, a little background uh, information about elder abuse prevention Ontario. We are a not-for-profit organization mandated to support the implementation of Ontario's strategy to combat elder abuse, and I've been doing so since 2003. We get funded by Ontario's Ministry of Seniors and Accessibility, and we work in partnership with them to offer our programming and outreach to each community in the province. We offer training, education, and community collaboration. Our goal is to stop abuse throughout the province through community coordination and response by working with our community networks throughout the province, training, and public awareness. I'd like to introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is Deborah Sarewich. She's a member of the Wasixing First Nation on the beautiful shores of Georgian Bay. She resides in Richmond Hill with her husband. She's a proud mother of an adult son and daughter and blessed with six beautiful grandchildren. With 30 plus years in management, director of business development and in healthcare sector, building collaborative innovative partnerships, motivational leadership, coaching, with a proactive approach, bringing partnerships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. One of the founders of the Integrated Partnerships for Seniors, also called TICS, uh, a collaborative group representing organizations providing services and support for seniors in the community. She's past chair, Pre uh, Prevention of Elder Abuse Committee, York Region. She volunteers in the Out of the Cold program in Richmond Hill, It's Not Right, Neighbors, Friends and Families, for older adults presenter and uh, how you can identify abuse and help older adults at risk. Deborah genuinely believes that we must have a safe, secure environment where families trust that there are securities in place. We just need to ask and listen. So Deb. Thanks so much, Randy, for the introduction. I'd also like to uh, thank Marion once again for the beautiful music. It's uh, the cadence of our heart. When uh, Randy and Sheila and Rianne approached me about presenting um, a passion with my heart is uh, opening the doors to our Indigenous senior community, I thought what a great opportunity to share, to share the knowledge and what I've done in, in different areas of how we can move together. So um, I'd like to start with uh, a question, moving on to a uh, our next slide here is, how can we support you to know that you're not forgotten? We know that our older adults do well in community, but families are not aware of where to find services or resources. We recognize that there are different pathways to life care, respect, 
trust and commitment with collaborative, innovative partnerships where one can live in place and thrive. And that's what I was just sharing with you. My reflection, my calmness, like many of you, is our water. Our water is our calming. And this is just taking a moment to uh, know that, taking the time to ask and let them know our older adults, our community, those at home, they're not alone. They're not forgotten. Approximately 17 years ago, I sat on a brainstorming committee. Crisis happens and many people say, how do we move forward? Where do we turn for help? 17 years ago, we started a networking group called TIPS. TIPS, the Integrated Partnership for Seniors. And I'd like to take this as a base model to share with the success factors on how TIPS is an opportunity that we can engage and can continue to build the journey, the circle of life. Our goal with TIPS when we started was to bring the awareness of community supports provided by nonprofit and private agencies to share information. It's fostering partnerships between our care providers and our care coordinators to improve the continuing of service. It was also to, and it is, to share professional development opportunities, educate community on services, supports that are available to seniors and how to navigate the system efficiently. Bridging the communication between government funded programs and other community service providers. It's taking a proactive approach rather than a reactive approach. And I receive endless calls from families and communities across the province, across our great nation of how can we build this? How can we sustain this? How can we move forward? Because so many of us just don't know where to reach out. Fast forward, 17 years later, we have over 150 of our community members that enhance service providers to seniors, to families and awareness in the community. Sharing this model has been very successful and taking the opportunity today to show how we can develop and work together. Since March, 2020, COVID has changed our landscape and more so than ever, do we need to work together collaboratively and innovative. So moving on, I'd like to share a little bit of a life lesson. I was uh, presenting at a conference and when I put this slide in here, a lot of people say, well, Deb, how does this relate? Well, I always refer to when I'm giving a lesson or support or relating it to nature or something that was brought to my attention. Looking at these two items here, a carrot and a broccoli, what are you? After I was presenting a founder of the organization, we were talking and he was sharing with me, he said, Deb, there's so many carrots out there. And he's continuing and talking to me about carrots and carrots. And I said, George, what is it? What is it that you're talking about a carrot? He said, because you're not a carrot, you're a broccoli. I said, a broccoli? Why am I a broccoli? He said, a carrot is like a silo a silo that keeps to themselves and wants to do it by themselves. But a broccoli is healthy, it's green, it's lush, and it grows vibrant. It shares, and that's what we strive to do, and that's what I continue to strive. As uh, many family members will say, you know, Deb, you've got the university of life. I may be poor with what I keep, but I'm very rich with what I've shared and I continue to work on it every day. I've shared with you now on our next slide, something that we've got a population on our participants today of 138 coming from all areas of the province, including Yellowknife I've noticed as well, welcome. 
people say, how big is Ontario? How big do we need to go? Well, showing you how large our province is, the largest populations of our Indigenous people in the province of Ontario reside in the Northwest Lynn. That's from North Bay right through to the border of our Ontario. 21.5% of the population size. The largest land mass. In conversation with many people that I speak with in different areas of the province, and I'll ask, how can I communicate? How can I bring awareness? and I take them up on their offer. Don't ask me what you can do, come and see. We all need to know that we are not alone. Understanding how our current Indigenous issues impact our Indigenous communities. The goal, my vision, to create a user-friendly database for our community members of service providers for our Indigenous First Nation communities. Profiles, of the services that you actually provide by when you were viewing that map that I had shared with you earlier, that you noticed in your profile. Can you actually deliver the services that you say? Unfortunately, so many broken promises are made where one will say we can deliver, we will pilot, but will we succeed? Go beyond visualize the distances, think beyond where you are and how you too collaboratively bring the supports together. Bringing to what is we call, and everybody is now in the new buzzword, is the age-friendly community. Our age-friendly community reaches so many people in all walks of life. It's that diversity of health services that also include home visits, community activities, bringing together many generations. I know when I sit with family and on powwow trails in different areas in different communities, we sit together as a family. There's lots of laughter, but laughter is our healing. Laughter is our medicine. Do we actually listen? and ask our community members to share what resources they feel would be beneficial to improve the quality of life care. Don't think about it as health care. Think about it as life care. Build relationships within the community, understanding our roles. Do you know that if you ask, even with developing with members of the community and members in different areas of a survey on what do they feel that they need to age in place. Food, transportation, life care. We also need to be culturally safe, accessible, sustainable, person and community centered, but multidisciplinary in what we provide. The tree of life, a tree of life, as we know, we start with a very small sapling and it grows and we nurture it. We walk in our great lands and we see our forests getting taller and taller and the many branches that are out there and the leaves that continue to grow. What is an age-friendly community? It's creating an age-friendly community by asking and listening, not assuming. We hear so much by government stating that we've donated or not, excuse me, not donated, we are going to be giving. Did you ask? Is this what we, is required? It can vary from one area to the other. The necessities of life, safe, clean water to drink, wood for heating, healthy eating. Water is our medicine. An auntie was sharing with me, would you shower in orange juice, coffee or tea? Think about it, healthy, water, healthy, clean water is what we need. And many of you, and who I've met over the years, you may be able to provide that resource of helping with our water. Our resources within walking distances, or is there accessible transportation? Walking distance 
Is it well lit? Is it accessible with the ramp? Why I'm stating this is, as you know, when you visit a community or an area, many of our homes are a mile apart, even further. Now, when you're looking at building a health center or programs, is it accessible? I was out west in January, I wanted to share, a, I was out at a, a community in, in Penticton uh, late January this year and they had this amazing health center and they wanted to share it with me. And they had all the health rooms and they had the diabetes, they had education rooms, they had mom and tot room, they had programs for elders, et cetera, and it went on and on. And they showed me the most amazing room for a dentist. So, oh, you're so fortunate to have a dentist in your community. Oh, Deb, we don't have a dentist. We visualize with the community supports and resources that we will build it and they will come. And that's what we're doing here today is collaborating. Availability of equipment and aids. Look again at that province. Always remember, can you provide? Seniors visit. It's so important, whether you're isolated, you have a disability, or as an older adult, many of our programs are um, very important that they're not virtual. Now with the landscape of COVID, everybody said, yes, I'm doing virtual support systems. That's great. But as studies have shown, most people don't own a computer. Internet? Well, in the North, we have dial-up and dial up with the phones as well. You can't rely on that. Face-to-face -face visiting, programs that you can do by telephone. Pick up the telephone, make that distance. Transportation, I stress the need of making transportation available both day and evening. When I was uh, researching about age-friendly communities and visiting at a distance, I was so blessed to be able to see on the Alzheimer's Society, Timmins Porcupine District had on their home page an amazing document that you can print as well and download and use it. Together apart, a guide for visiting from a distance. I encourage you to take the time to review this and add this document to your age-friendly community. So you may be in Yellowknife, but your family member may live on James Bay. So using this document can help you in more ways. Continue to network with the community groups. And if they're not available, pick up the phone. And for those of you in Southern Ontario, do you have that service? Do you have that support that you can develop a program by telephone? Not always Zoom, but speaking with the um, family up in the uh, Cape Croker area, they have a telephone system where you can call and 20 people have a code. They can play bingo. They can have their news and community. They can have information. They can also have conversation trivia night, biography night. We all have a biography and it's up to us to share it. Can we move on to the next slide? Thank you. A buddy system, the phone check-in. You may want to have one person who's responsible for looking after three or four people. Train the trainer. A train the trainer program is so important. Meals on Wheels in Southern Ontario, but we call it the Friendly Meal Program. And some communities have taken it a step further for a very minimal fee. They're getting five or six meals. So that isolated senior or older adult is getting healthy eating and knowing that they're having a nutritious meal on the table. Because they're alone, it doesn't mean that they can't eat healthy. Senior Safety Officer. A senior safety officer, snow removal, yard maintenance, and food banks. And in closing, moving on to our 
next slide here. I'd also like to thank you for the opportunity of sharing. And at any time, if you ever feel that you need to reach out, I've included my, my email in there. Together, our voices will travel and uh, we will make a difference by providing the resources, the supports. Miigwech. Thanks so much, Deb. That was absolutely fantastic. Um, so uh, uh, just a reminder, uh, if there's any questions, please put them in the chat box. And again, my uh, colleague, Sheila, will organize some questions and answers at the, uh, at the end of this. Um, let's see. Hang on. Uh, let's see. There we go. Sorry, technical glitches, of course. Um, next, I would like to introduce um, Muriel Bittern. Muriel was born and raised in, uh, as a matter of fact, you know, why don't I just share this screen? Yeah, that won't work. Muriel was born and raised in Valley River, Manitoba, and is a member of Treaty Number no. Two. At a young age, she moved to Winnipeg and has been a resident of that city for most of her life. Muriel originally graduated from Red River College in their community-centered therapy program and went on to become a graduate of New York University's counseling program with a focus on PTSD and complex trauma. She is a mother of three sons and a grandmother of five with another one on the way. Muriel is a strong faith believer in our creator God with significant compassion and care for giving to others. She has worked for the North End Women's Centre in Winnipeg as a knowledge keeper and spends about six months a year in Muskrat Dam as a counsellor at the Reverend Tommy Beardy Memorial Treatment Centre. So, Muriel, welcome. Welcome. Hi. Now, I know that Muriel is uh, also a rookie to Zoom, so, uh, so we just got, got Zoom all figured out in the last 24 hours. So welcome, Muriel. Thank you, Randy. I'm happy to be here for to speak about uh, the elderly abuse, how I uh, how I understand it, and how I learned from elders and how to be um, become the knowledge keeper that they had uh, saw me in as. Uh, I am from Valley River, Manitoba, and I also live in Winnipeg. Um, my compassion has always been to help others, um, uh, elderly to the young, uh, because we all we all mean something. Um, it, um, I can't see you, Randy. Oh, sorry. Um, yes, and so. Randy, you have asked me to talk about elderly abuse. Well, the way I see elderly abuse is for, you know, we need to listen to elders. They are very wise. Um, they, they have lots of wisdom in their, they've had a lot of experiences in life. And, you know, when you listen to an elder, you learn from them. And I'm always learning from learning from both the, both sides, the young and the elderly. And so it's important to always listen to an elder. Um, I have a father who's 95, uh, still alive. And, you know, I learn a lot from him um, because communication is the key to everything. Um, without communication, um, we get lost, right? So. Yeah, and then, um, see, I learned a lot from the northern communities of where I work, um, uh, at the Muskrat Dam Treatment Center. And I see the elders over there, and, you know, they're very, um, they have their own unique ways of life. Um, they, they keep the traditions, and I learned from that. I learned from that 
community also because we've lost we've lost a lot of communica communications because you know we've been through a lot uh from uh, residential schools but we learn a lot from the uh the elders that are um, here with us and so i get much wisdom from them um yes and you know there's a lot of um care from the elders they have this compassion of helping younger generation but also the younger generation need to reach out to listen to these elders that's that's the main thing for me is communicating with elders i see that there's not so many many things that uh, you know they're they're not going to elders for for wisdom and you know because like for me that's what i do i give out the wisdom that i know um to share a lot of experiences that i had learned from in life like i keep saying you learn from the wrong that's the weakness that strengths in you and that i learned from the elders so we what i'm saying is like we need to listen to elders because they have like i said much wisdom and they're very caring and in the in the community of Muskradan, my work in, they all work together, elders to the young, and they all, all work together as a community. Um, they have um, a health center there. Um, uh, uh, the uh, family treatment center I work from, and also <laughs> elders come together to have, they have programs for them, even in evening activities. But like right now for this COVID, it's uh, very difficult to have all those outreach programs that they have in the community. And um, in other communities, I can imagine, they also are going through the same thing because of the COVID. Um, there's not so many ways of uh, reaching out to the elders because of the isolation we're having. And um, also, um, the, um, but they do communicate through telephone and most um, elders don't ha uh, know how to use technology as um, internet users. And so um, they communicate through telephone. And, uh, you know, um, it must be, I can just imagine what the elders are going through at the moment. Um, because they, they care for families, they care for their community, and, you know, they, they have no way of communicating from to the outside world. And so, yeah, that's one of the, uh, the things I see is to communicate. Muriel? Yes. I know a, a lot of people aren't really, aren't truly familiar with, with life in a remote Northern First Nation. Can you just talk a little bit about what, what life is, is really like in Muskrat Dam? I know it's a population of about 380 people. Um, mm -hmm. It's on a huge area of land, but it is a very remote First Nation. Can you talk a little bit about what life is like in Muskrat Dam? Oh, okay. How I see Muskrat Dam is uh, like it's very friendly, very friendly community. Um, they have um, they've had water issues, uh, which they have corrected. That they they were on the uh, um, water boil, uh, being aware of like. Um, they were made aware that um, um, also um, they they are very isolated. The only way of transportation is through air, uh, flying, um, winter road, and um, their supplies of food and uh, um, 
anything like household goods and all that they have to wait for for uh, for the uh, winter road to get those things delivered that they need um like household goods like for instance a washer dryer they have to wait for winter road to open so that you know because the cost is so high for freight and so they wait for the winter to to um also their fundings are very low um they like i said they have to wait for for uh and there's no bank so they have to uh, find ways of getting money and like i said again internet they're not uh, very good at internet because I, I shouldn't say that forgive me for saying that but they're they're um they're, they're not knowledgeable in um in um, technology, but um, they do have families that help them with those technologies uh, to provide for for fundings. Uh, they they are so remote that they they don't have.